What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Tuesday, January 26th, with Mr. Nadav Cohen from Shirt Bits again to catch us up on what's going on with DLCs. So, what's up, Nadav? Hey, thanks for having me again. Yeah, I mean, it's always a fun time having you stretch my brain to its limits. <laughs> That's what we're here for, I guess. Yeah, so uh, I guess before we start diving into autistic things, uh, I saw on the uh, Bitcoin dev mailing list that you guys are setting up a uh, a DLC mailing list and trying to uh, congregate the brain share there. Yeah, we, we have a new mailing list. Um, we also uh, are nearing a kind of V0 release uh, for the specification. Uh, getting getting more stable, things are coming together. It's uh, exciting. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of work under the hood here. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure when we get to the multi-Oracle stuff, uh, you're going to have to help refresh my brain a little bit. Yeah, totally. We can, we can start from scratch. So I guess, uh, yeah, you know, the whole idea is... Uh, pile up a lot of pre-signed transactions so that um, an oracle can work their magic and guarantee an outcome, but that uh, can potentially wind up being a lot of pre-signed transactions. Yeah, so do you want, should I like go back and explain what a DLC is? Maybe? <laughs> uh, I would hope or... that we wouldn't have to at this point, but it's probably a good idea. It can't hurt, you know. Um... All right, so a uh, discrete log contract or DLC is basically um, an Oracle contract uh, that you can execute on Bitcoin. And how it works is you have um, a funding transaction, which is a lot like Lightning, where uh, two parties who are entering into some kind of contract that's contingent on what an Oracle says happens in the real world. Uh, they, they put their funds into a two of two multi-sig and then they have a bunch of on off-chain uh, transactions which um, spend that funding transaction uh, and then they have a, one of these off-chain transactions for every possible uh, thing the Oracle could sign uh, which is why you have a lot of them and um, then you provide uh, your counterparty uh, encrypted signatures of each of these off-chain transactions. So we call these off-chain transactions uh, contract execution transactions, or CETs for short. And uh, essentially each CET corresponds to one Oracle event, and uh, each of these CETs um, has uh, the, the payouts that correspond to their events, and uh, you give your counterparty a signature for each CET, uh, that is encrypted using the Oracle's pub key uh, and some extra information so that uh, it, the decryption key uh, is the Oracle signature of this event. So in this way, uh, kind of all of these off-chain transactions are locked uh, with like an Oracle lock, if you will, and then um, they get exactly one of them gets unlocked by the Oracle when the Oracle Oracle signs what happened. So say, you know, you're using a price Oracle, the Oracle signs like 31K or something like that. Uh, and then your contract executes off of that with just a single on-chain transaction afterwards uh, to execute and, and all of the others kind of just get discarded. Um, yeah, but that's what a DLC is at a high level. It kind of in theory enables anything you want. But in practice, as you mentioned, uh, you get kind of just a ton of CETs. And so uh, we've done quite a bit of work to kind of reduce that number in lots of uh, tricky ways. Yeah, because, you know, that's uh, kind of potentially restricting um, the lower down the rung of consumer devices in terms of what you can actually bet on. 
Totally. And especially given that um, since uh, today, these encrypted signatures, also known as adapter signatures, um, they uh, to, to do them on ECDSA uh, is a bit more heavy duty than to do them uh, on, say, Schnorr or something in the future once we have Taproot. Uh, they're like 162 bytes a piece instead of just 64. Uh, and they also uh, take a bit longer to compute. So uh, yeah, the the CET number certainly kind of is is the bottleneck for for most things uh, to do with DLCs, um, at least large ones, and especially when you're doing stuff with numeric outcomes, which we expect a lot of people to do, uh, with for example financial contracts. Um, there, you know, if if you're covering all possible like BTC USD prices from zero to like a million <laughs> that's going to be a lot of CETs and uh yeah we we essentially have some fancy ways of cutting that down uh to, to be a more practical number usually in the thousands um should I jump right into how we what we've done yeah I, actually before we dive into that my, my brain has a few random questions um sure <laughs> have you guys um like done benchmarking in terms of um, different devices and the kinds of uh, CET um, processing throughput they could get, like say, you know, your average desktop versus somebody who only has a mobile phone? Uh, we have not done much of that yet, in part because um, kind of the, the DLC implementations that have all of this stuff done are, are pretty unoptimized. Uh, pretty rough around the edges, very uh, proof of concept MVP kind of implementations. I mean, they work, uh, especially uh, after these optimizations uh, for the actual number of CETs once that gets them. But uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the benchmarking stuff that we're going to be doing with DLCs, uh, we're kind of uh, waiting for Rust DLC to. Uh, advance a little more and then we'll probably do most benchmarking using that library um, just because you know a rust is super performant and b uh, rust dlc is much more of a like, like it's it's a dlc only library whereas for example uh, bitcoin s which is the implementation i've made um, is uh, in this larger library where for example uh, transactions aren't as optimized as they could be. I mean, we, we will go back and optimize all of these things, but just seeing as we have a lot of other priorities, uh, we probably will be doing a lot of our benchmarking using Rust DLC. That said, I have like some rough estimates based off of Bitcoin S just running on like my laptop um, for uh, where the big bottlenecks are, but uh, I don't have a great idea of like what the picture looks like on a mobile phone versus a, a laptop or anything like that at this point. But it's probably safe to say um, that's going to require a lot of optimization, um, and not just yeah. code-wise, but also the uh, neat trick you guys came up with. Yeah, and uh, there's also there's a kind of parameters uh, that you can, you can play with, uh, with trade-offs associated with them, of course, um, which can make the, the optimization picture prettier as well. Yeah, so I guess uh, you want to get into uh, how exactly you're compressing CET transactions? Sure thing. So um, the first trick is uh, almost uh, <laughs> specified, or at least it, it's kind of alluded to in the DLC white paper. Uh, in the DLC white paper, there is this optimization mentioned where uh, if you're signing a number, rather than just signing the number, you can sign kind of two numbers, a base and an exponent, um, so that uh, you can, for example, uh, if, the, uh, uh, if one of those numbers falls in a certain range, then you don't care what the other number is, and uh, you can just have a single CET that covers a lot of cases. Uh, we kind of took the uh, kind of full extent or the, the logical conclusion of kind of that uh, way of thinking. And we have the oracles sign every single bit 
of the number individually. So, you know, you, you take your number, write it down in binary as a bunch of zeros and ones, and then the oracle signs each of those zeros and ones individually, uh, usually with a bunch of leading zeros so that they can uh, be ready if, you know, they ever have some extreme case or something. Um, and then what this lets you do is essentially uh, you don't usually have to, or you don't often have to look at every digit um, to, to know where you are on kind of your payout curve. So if you imagine uh, just kind of like you have a, a graph, like an XY graph, where um, you have uh, kind of your, your payout on the Y axis and the price, say it's the BTC USD price on the X axis. So say you're kind of doing like a forward contract with, or collared forward contract, I guess it would be called. So the picture is kind of just like a line going up. Um, you'd be going long BTC, uh, but usually it's not like a line going up from zero and up to like the maximum number. Usually it's like you have some bounds on your price and if it's beneath a certain price, uh, say like if it, if it goes beneath 10K, then um, you you just get zero, and if it goes above, say like fifty k or something like this, uh, then you get the entire collateral of the other party as well. So the kind of the total collateral. So you have these collars, uh, meaning just these flat portions on the sides uh, that bound kind of the exposure, and then everything in between is kind of the interesting part of the payout curve. And uh, you can imagine like in a contract like this, where it collars off at like 50K, if the Oracle is supporting numbers up to like a million, it's kind of a huge waste to have, uh, you know, all the numbers between uh, 50K and a million, each of them having their own CET. Uh, so instead we can do actually a, a good amount of compression just by, um, you know, if you look at, for example, the first digit and it's a one, well, you know that you're on that collar for sure. Uh, because, um, you know, essentially what that means, if the first digit is one, you're in the second half of your domain, which is going to be, you know, anything above um, uh, a bit over 50 million. Uh, or, you know, I think it's... Uh, so in, in this scenario, when I say a million, what I really mean is like 20 binary digits, which is a little... The maximum value there is a little over a million. So here... Um, the, if the first digit is one, that means that the number must be over half a million. So if the number is over half a million, it's certainly over 50K. And so you don't have to look any further. You can just from that one digit know that you are uh, on that caller and you know what the payout is. And so you construct a single CET and the single CET kind of covers half a million cases by itself. And then you kind of, you know, you continue this. It, it has a uh, kind of a similar feel to like a binary search. And then the more digits that you can ignore, the more cases that you end up covering. Um, and we just kind of have this algorithm that goes through your payout curve and uh, compresses the entire range into um, kind of as few as, it, uh, as we can um, CETs. And uh, that's kind of the, the first step. And then we, we kind of optimize this even further. I mentioned that there were some parameters. One of them is um, that if you're willing to round, um, then this algorithm, which essentially uh, takes advantage of flatness, if you have a bunch of consecutive outcomes that all have the same payout, then you can always compress that by ignoring the last couple bits uh, into just one or two CETs, for example. Uh, if it's, you know, if, if we're looking at a small group or, you know, possibly many, many uh, CTs being compressed into just a few, uh, it's, it's kind of this logarithmic compression that we have. Um, and so uh, if you're willing to round, so say, you know, you and me round to the nearest hundred Satoshis or thousand Satoshis or something like this, um, then you end up getting a much more kind of like staircase looking payout curve where uh, the values that you take on aren't at every one Satoshi, they're at every hundred or thousand Satoshis. So if you zoom out, it still looks like your picture, you know, the error that you have compared to, you know, your actual payout curve that you want to be representing is still very low, right? It's in like, 
you know, a couple cents uh, at max uh, if you're doing these things, at least in today's terms. You know, a small percentage of the total collateral if you want to speak in, in SAT terms. Um, but you actually get like huge gains because uh, every time that, um, you know, you even get like three numbers in a row that have the same payout, you can always do at least one compression there. And if you get, you know, more than that, if you get like uh, six in a row, seven in a row, I have, anyway, you, you get at least like a compression of like one CT covering four cases and then another CT covering two cases and uh, so on and so forth. So essentially, uh, you know, the, the flatter or more choppy that you're willing to make your curve, uh, the fewer CETs you have. And especially, you know, even just a little bit of rounding, like a very small, like 100 Satoshis or something like this, um, kind of turns all of the flatter parts of your payout curve into actually uh, a couple flat pieces, um, which reduces the number of CETs immensely, especially when you're doing stuff like a contract for difference, for example, or uh, any of these um, kind of one over X shaped curves where at the end it doesn't go off to zero like it did in the example I gave earlier with a uh, colored forward. But uh, in these kind of one over X cases, uh, you you kind of taper off and it, it goes towards zero, but it doesn't actually hit it. Um, but it is very flat. So if you do a little bit of round, you get kind of like, uh, you know, a staircase with very long steps, which you can compress each of those steps into kind of just a very small number of CETs. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, I mean, this is still just a single oracle, but this is kind of the, the big optimization that lets you turn like, you know, a million CETs into just a couple thousand, where all of the CETs you have now are more or less, or the majority of them, are just used to cover the cases that uh, are interesting, so to speak, or that are probable uh, near the current price, say, for example. Well, yeah, uh, you know, to kind of walk back through that a little bit, I mean, you know, to start um, just bounding each side um, with the digit decomposition, I mean, that in and of itself fixes a major problem because if if you only have collateral for between say 10 and 50,000 and the price settles at 51,000 well how does that oracle signature actually close out that contract if you're just yeah. numerating so, prices strictly yeah so this certainly lets oracles sign more digits than they need to uh which is really nice uh but you know in theory we still have this problem of like what if the price goes over like a million significantly uh, or, or something like this. And uh, so our, our kind of solution to this is just that uh, if the Oracle signs the maximum or the minimum number, we interpret that as min or less and max or more. Um, so, but but yeah, it's, it's not elegant to have, you know, an Oracle ever sign max or more. It's kind of more fail safe. So it is nice to be able to extend um, you know, they, they can sign as many digits as they want, and it doesn't really incur uh, any, any real costs to clients if they are going crazy and signing like 30 digits where like 15 would have done the trick. Well, I mean, also, though, I mean, just just think of I'm just trying to kind of like simplify this uh, <laughs> for as many people as possible. Sure. But I, I just mean like the issue of um, how the Oracle has no clue what anybody making a DLC off it is doing. So like those those bounds, there there has to be that way to guarantee if it goes outside of them that still settles correctly. And like transaction compression aside, like the the basic digit decomposition that you guys are doing, that that enables that. So that you don't gotcha. have the risk of like, well, this can't settle with what the Oracle published. So now everybody gets their money back. And that was a giant waste of time. Yeah, yeah. So there, I mean, there were kind of a couple different approaches when we were first trying to, you know, think about that, solve this problem. One of them was to, uh, you know, have the Oracle sign things in like base 10 and sign like those digits individually. And then, you know, if people wanted to 
reduce the number of CTs, then they could just like ignore some of the Oracle signatures and just be betting on like intervals of like a hundred changes or something like this. But then I, I ended up figuring out that you could, um, you could kind of do it this way where, yeah, kind of like you mentioned, it's super customizable on the client side uh, in a way where kind of the Oracle signing these binary digits just allows clients to do anything that they want to in a nice practical fashion um, where, you know, they can have super high fidelity and then they can decide on their own, like what kind of rounding they want to do. Uh, and everything's just kind of trying to get the best of both worlds in terms of like fidelity to the payout curve and, uh, you know, reducing the number of CTs and it's somewhere in the, the sweet spot in between where, uh, you know, your, your error from your payout curve is never more than like in practice, you know, as far as what I've done, you know, it's never been more than like a couple cents and, uh, the uh, number of CTs has always been like below 10k, um, which is which has been very practical. Mm-hmm. And like that, that's the the next thing with the the entire rounding trick. I mean, like that is just stupidly efficient in the terms of like I I think the way that you put things in math terms might not click in everybody's head yeah but like, I, have, I have a kind of much dumber way of saying or not dumber but much simpler high level <laughs> way of saying it which is um you know essentially if you think of kind of signing each binary bit or you know assigning you know the number in in you know each piece of information that it that number is represented with on a computer signing that separately what that does is it lets you take you know if you have your your payout curve um which is just you know the graph of how much money you get for a given outcome uh you know if it slopes up you're going long uh if it slopes down you're going short speaking in super simple terms um then uh if it's flat at any point you can always turn that into um like a negligible number of CETs or much fewer CETs. Um, And so, you know, originally we thought that this just solved kind of the caller problem where, um, you know, most people choose their own bounds, say for, in my example, like 10 to 50 K for the price. And then they want to like essentially just have like, you know, winner take all for everything beyond that and kind of this compression trick since that's a flat piece of the curve, lets you turn that into everything else into a negligible number of um, CETs. Uh, This rounding trick essentially lets you kind of generalize where it's not, it doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but if it's like flat-ish, so say, you know, you have a downward sloping curve, but it like kind of is, it it tapers off, like it, it gets closer and closer to being flat. Uh, kind of, you know, if you have 1 over x, for example, um, or, you know, something that looks more like the bottom piece of a parabola or something like that, um, then uh, you can optimize those cases as well. And you can also compress all of those cases. So you can now take advantage of, like, flatness in general. And the only places that you, you know, still, practically speaking, have to have one CET per outcome are the super steep parts. Um, but the, the good news is that kind of by definition, if you have a super steep part of your curve where like if the price moves a little bit in this area, the outcome changes a lot, um, you know, kind of by definition, you can't have too much of that going on, uh, <laughs> or, you know, that can't last forever because eventually, you know, you're going to cross like zero or you're going to cross the total collateral just because of how steep it is. So you don't need too many CETs uh, to cover those cases relative to kind of the flatter cases, which were the bigger problem. Mm-hmm. And, and just kind of like looking at this naively without all the other tricks you're putting together. I mean, just the rounding issue would be like if you are if you were doing this naively without digit decomposition and we're trying to say do things granularly by single satoshis and decided let's let's do that by units of 100 satoshis like you you've just taken the transactions necessary down by a factor of 100 yeah whereas here we're kind of just like 
shaving it down to just the transactions that matter or the outcomes that really matter or you know not that like if it goes beyond on a caller uh, outside of bounds it doesn't matter it's just not very interesting from the contract's point of view so it shouldn't require many CTs and then this rounding trick kind of takes it a step further where you know you have a not only a multiplier where you kind of can reduce even on the interesting parts but now even on like slightly less interesting parts require far few CETs. So really where the interesting part of your contract is, is where um, you're, you have to actually construct a bunch of CETs. And I should say kind of at a high level, instead of thinking of this as like you ignore digits, maybe an easier way for most people to think about what this is doing is it lets you essentially construct rather than having one CET per outcome, you can now you, you kind of have these Lego building blocks where you can have CTs that cover one outcome, two outcome, four, eight, 16, 32, any power of two. Um, and they, they can't just be placed anywhere. They have to like start on a multiple of that number. So like a multiple of 32 to the next multiple of 32. Um, but essentially you have these much bigger kind of Legos that you can use to cover your entire um, outcome space, you know, all of the possible outcomes where you're not restricted to just using one CET per price. Now you can use kind of these much bigger pieces. And uh, generally speaking, I guess what I'm saying is we found ways where the flatter it is, the larger the pieces you can use to kind of cover um, your, uh, your, your uh, contract uh, or build your contract from maybe. And especially with like these collars, you use like these gigantic Lego pieces to cover the entire thing in just a couple transactions. Um, and then for the actual payout curve, we, we have also significant reductions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in practice, like, you know, we did an on-chain um, contract for difference a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is essentially a DLC where um, one party enters into the contract and they want kind of a fixed or stable USD value. You can think of this as like a synthetic um, USD on Bitcoin. So uh, in this case, it was me and Roman and Roman came in with, uh, I think it was like $28 and 20 cents, if I'm not mistaken, uh, worth of Bitcoin into the contract. And then, you know, I matched uh, the same amount of Bitcoin in this case. Um, and then uh, after a week when we exited this contract, um, so essentially I was going long BTC and uh, if you want stable USD, you're essentially going short BTC. Um, but from you know the user's perspective, really what it looks like is you know they're locking up some funds and when they pull those funds out next week, regardless of what the BTC price is, they have the same amount of USD. So if the price goes up, then they have to give up funds so that they have the same amount of USD. And if the price goes down, then uh, their counterparty, in this case me, I had to give up funds in order to compensate them for that price movement. So essentially it lets them use BTC without necessarily um, having to denominate things or be exposed to uh, BTC USD as an index. Um, and uh, the, the curve for this, you can kind of imagine, like maybe I should use simpler numbers. Uh, say they, they come in when the price is, uh, you know, 10k at uh and, and they come in with like uh 10,000 satoshis or something like this um well if the price goes to 20k then they should really leave with 5,000 satoshis right if if the price doubles they should have half as many satoshis uh but if it goes the other way if the price is 5,000 uh, then they should leave with 20,000 satoshis. So it doubles. So you have this kind of like downward sloping curve, which makes sense because as I said, uh, the person who wants fixed USD value, really they're shorting BTC in a very specific way. Um, and then their counterparty, they kind of have the flip side. So in this case, I was going long BTC. Um, and, uh, you know, you can imagine, you know, we're, we covered every single possible case from like the price going to zero all the way up to like the price going to like 130 something thousand, whatever uh, 17 binary digits gives you in this case. Um, and we covered all of that uh, with a little bit of rounding, but really not very much. I think uh, to the nearest hundred or thousand Satoshis was the most we did anywhere. 
Um, and we were able to set up this entire contract uh, very practically in, uh, I think it was like 6,000 CETs or something uh, along those lines, which is, you know, very practical to, to run on, you know, I assume many devices in the future once we've optimized our code. So I'd be remiss if I didn't get a little cheeky here, but have you guys considered the scaling problem of when a Satoshi is worth a whole dollar and people don't want to round giant chunks of Satoshis? <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a good point. So uh, a couple answers. Uh, first, you know, long term these will be going where most Bitcoin activity will be going, you know, likely lightning or, or someplace like that, uh, which is where we'll be executing these. And once that is happening, you know, you can round to the nearest hundred millisatoshis if you like. Um, but, uh, you know, that aside, um, I guess the, the good news uh, for us at least is that these are entirely, you know, Bitcoin collateralized contracts. So at the end of the day, I like to think of it less uh, as like, here's your couple cent fee and more as like, um, you know, some percentage of the contract size. So, you know, if you're using main chain, it's probably because it's a decent sized contract and, you know, a couple, you know, tens or hundreds of Satoshis isn't going to make a big difference compared to like the ginormous payouts uh, or even, you know, moderate payouts like right a hundred satoshis to a hundred thousand satoshi contract or something like this is still uh you know i mean it's it's not negligible but it isn't all that significant um and you know you're already paying on chain fees it's not uh too uh far from that and in this case it's not that uh you know this is kind of the error you know i should I, I guess, you know, you don't want your error to, to be too large, but this error doesn't go to miners, right? It ends up going to one party or another. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, you, you can treat it as another fee where sometimes you get paid the fee by the other party and sometimes you pay that fee to the, to the other party and it's like an optimization fee or something like this uh, if, if you wanted to sell it uh, uh, from a UX perspective. But I assume that this stuff will be pretty hidden in the future and uh yeah i guess i'm not too worried about that situation yeah and i mean you know the the way that you guys build these curves out i mean you, you can do things like make sure that the c8 or cet count is really dense close to the starting point and then kind of spread out um the, the rounding or, or the margin of error there, like the further you get away from that, right? So that like yeah, you don't have been. like a, a tight close screw somebody when it should be like down to the wire, but when somebody's clearly winning, like eh, who cares about a few thousand Satoshis? Yeah, uh, and I should mention this, this rounding that we're doing is very dynamic in the sense that you choose, you know, depending on what the outcome is, you can round different amounts. I mean, you have to decide ahead of time. So we have kind of what we call them rounding intervals. So say like if the price is between 10K and, you know, 50K, then we want to round maybe a little less. And if it's a less probable outcome, we can round a little more. So I, I think that's generally how I think about it is, um, the, the more probable cases we want to be rounding less and the less probable cases we want to be rounding more. Um, but, you know, even in the probable cases, you know, rounding to the nearest hundred Satoshis is usually worth it. Like, you know, a hundred Satoshis not worth that much, uh, but rounding to the nearest hundred Satoshis is a, a pretty significant uh, reduction in, in the number of CTs usually. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you can do like 100 in, in the places it matters, you know, near the current price, for example, and then, you know, expand that to like a thousand outside some some range. Very flexible, very useful, very hard drive friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we also we kind of these payout curves I've been talking about, we have pretty general support using uh, interpolation. So you kind of compress your payout curve into just a couple points from which, uh, and, and that's what you send over the wire. Uh, and then that also kind of comes with instructions for how to 
quote unquote like connect the dots you can literally do just like a connect the dots with straight lines but we also support more interesting stuff like if you wanted to do like a cubic spline or something like that you know some way of uh you know approximating a curve for example um you can send that over the wire pretty efficiently and it it's pretty customizable i guess uh without making simple curves complicated so for example you know, if you want to do a simple forward contract, the thing I mentioned earlier, which is just like uh, a straight line going from, you know, left to right going up and, you know, collars on each side. So flat piece down at the bottom, flat piece up on top at zero and at your total collateral, uh, you know, that only requires like a couple points to specify. Really, you only need like the, you know, the end points of that line in order to specify the entire contract. Uh, so simple stuff stays simple, but then if you want to do something more complicated, you know, you're welcome to to do basically anything you want. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think users are going to be having to deal with, like, drawing out custom payout curves. They'll probably be dealing with, you know, some template financial contract that they enter parameters into, like, what's the strike price? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so... so are, are we ready the, for the the real fun part? Yeah. <laughs> the multi oracles. And I, I have to yell at you, Nadav, because this, this really took a little bit to wrap my head around because you had no pictures. I am aware, and I do have an issue open on the spec repository called Pretty Pictures, where it's an open call for pretty pictures if anyone wants to draw them. Uh, feel free to submit them to, for review. Um, I, I also will be adding pretty pictures. It's just not been, I guess, the highest on my priority list. Uh, if you look at the actual reference implementation, I do have some like text art in my code comments. <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the the DLC repo, hopefully, uh, at some point this year, will be getting pretty pictures. That is uh, high on my. Uh, wanting but not to do list, I guess. Uh, so apologies. <laughs> I've never heard for of that. a list like that before. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my it's my to do list for other people, just in the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will do it at some point if no one else does, of course. Um, yeah, but uh, kind of uh, a key feature of DLCs, or, or kind of you know at a high level. Discrete log contract, like as a scheme, is uh, a way of handling the Oracle problem. You know, it's a it's an answer. I won't say a solution, but it's an answer to the Oracle problem. There's no such thing as a solution, really. You know, the Oracle problem is that you need some amount of trust in order to do interesting things. You know, in order to rely what, on we real need world an interdimensional events. connection between computers and the simulation known as the universe. Uh, yeah, but like a very specific emergent phenomenon known as trust um, is, is needed <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you, you need some amount of trust. You got to put it somewhere. You know, that, that's why I like to say answer instead of solution. Like, you know, in some sense, solution would be like if you found a way to do it without trust, but that just doesn't exist. Like Bitcoin or any other protocol ha cannot, you know, natively know uh external things like you know who you know who who won the nfl you know super bowl or something like this like they they do not access to that information the uh, and if they did sorry good <laughs> dude craig wright actually is satoshi dude he's right bitcoin is turing complete it's supposed to be the host running the simulation of the universe so that all of that can be within the confines of bitcoin's consensus rule and solve the oracle problem yeah that sounds like something that craig wright would say um, <laughs> <laughs> I <couldn't help> <laughs> um <laughs> yeah but uh anyway um yeah so essentially since since there's there's no way of kind of having these things be native you need some you know someone or something to bring these into the system uh normally using like just a digital signature of what happened from an entity called an oracle um that that's kind of the simplest way is you just like have a person or an entity that you trust you know their public key 
and they sign like what happened. Uh, of course, this model has drawbacks. Um, DLCs uh, answer some of these drawbacks by making this entity oblivious. So I like to think of DLC oracles as being oblivious oracles. Uh, they don't know about their users. They don't know what their users are doing with them. They don't know how many users they have. They, they like know nothing. All they do is they broadcast signatures of events um, and they cannot trace themselves on chain, uh, which is a good sign to, to DLC users that, you know, if the Oracle can't see you on chain, they have more information than the average bystander, uh, you know, the, the average bystander can't see you either. Like your on-chain transactions just look like simple on-chain transactions. Because if you remember, the way that you use the Oracle is you use them as a decryption key for normal signatures, right? Like the the, sign the adapter, the encrypted signatures of the CETs um, are encrypted using the Oracle's, uh, you know, commitments. And uh, the Oracle signature allows parties to decrypt one of these signatures. So it's really only used off chain, the Oracle. And everything that hits the chain, the main chain, or you know, anywhere that uh, these DLC transactions end up, uh, has no trace of the Oracle left behind. Um, so yeah, kind of we have this, these nice privacy features uh, where privacy is you know, part of a, a trust security model. Um, I think I, on, a, on a previous episode, I heard Janine call privacy, you know, a subset of information security, right? You want to you wanna keep that information away from the Oracle because it makes it harder to do lots of things like exit scams or bribery or anything like that. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, using a single Oracle, not the best idea. Um, at least in DLCs, another nice mitigation is that you get to choose the entity and they don't know about you. Whereas, you know, you'll see in a lot of schemes on other protocols that don't need to be named um, that you you end up having like an entire system built around a single Oracle that's like hard coded into the system where like you have to use this one Oracle and they can see everything you're doing and you're like, quote unquote, smart contracts where everyone sees all of your code <laughs> and for, for your contract and things are off chain. What if that Oracle is my cousin Jimmy and he's just going to say whatever I bet on? Well, then you'll get rich, I guess. I mean, <laughs> like, sucks for everyone else. Um, not, not the best model, that's, uh, that's for certain. So, um, yeah, so I guess, uh, you know, one solution that, that DLCs allow is that they don't have to use your Uncle Jimmy. You know, they, they can use someone else who they actually have reason to trust. Um, you can still use uh, Jimmy if you want, but you know, no one else is obligated to um, if they don't trust Jimmy. But uh, this brings us to kind of the other more important, perhaps, uh, feature that DLCs, um, we, we all knew that it could be done in some way or another, but you know, uh, hadn't been tackled until pretty recently, is uh, allowing for multiple oracles, uh, specifically, you know, a threshold, some, you know, T of N, uh, oracles. So, you know, many Bitcoiners are, are pretty comfortable with, you know, the idea of, you know, multi-sig uh, in Bitcoin, which is where you need, say, like three of five keys to unlock some Bitcoin or two of three keys or, or something like this. So now we have we have the same thing for oracles where you only need two of three oracles to agree or three of five oracles to agree. Uh, so say, you know, if one goes online or gets hacked or is unreliable, then your contract is still good to go. Um, so this, uh, you know, does a lot of great stuff for us. It's, it's just better on all fronts. You know, the cost of bribery gets a multiplier because you have to bribe more than one entity. Um, and because DLCs have um, such nice built-in fraud proofs, you know, if, if an Oracle ever lies, they do so by providing a digital signature of, of something that is false, right? So it's very easy to gossip that around and make sure everyone knows that they're not trustworthy. Uh, so, you know, if you lie, you, you kind of give up operation. Like that that should be it for that Oracle if we build this this uh, infrastructure out correctly. So, you know, <laughs> the, the cost of bribery isn't just like, you know, so that you can get some cut of this. It's completely traceable. Uh, that an oracle lies 
And so, you know, add that on top of the fact that like that might not even sway the contract. You know, you're going to have to pay them up front because, you know, they're not going to trust that all these other oracles are also going to lie. Uh, and then, you know, why would you pay up front if you're not actually going to necessarily be getting the money? If any, you know, one oracle out of the I mean, maybe you have to overbribe. Uh, I guess, regardless, however you think about like the most cynical situation, it certainly gets much harder uh, when you're using two of three or three of five oracles. And then even in the more practical fail cases where, say, an oracle goes offline, goes out of business, say it was like an event 10 years in the future, gets something like this. by the government because they're facilitating not cool bets. Yeah, I mean, if... if uh, yeah the 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 legal questions around oracles especially something like a dlc oracle are very much unanswered in terms of uh it's certainly much better from a regulatory perspective than like an oracle that knows about its users or that is tied to a specific platform right this this kind of oblivious model is good for the oracle but yeah say you know in in some situation they they get like a cease and desist you know they can't broadcast signatures then, I mean, well, uh, you, you know, like, yeah. remember an old concept um, that I'm probably not going to explicitly name, but a very bad kind of marketplace to accomplish a certain thing. Um, I, I feel like, you know, a government wouldn't care about people betting on the price of Bitcoin, but something like that, they, they might care. This is true. I, I can imagine that uh, that would happen. Um, yeah. But regardless, you know, you can use oracles. You can diversify your oracles. You know, you can pick them from different countries, uh, different levels of sophistication, different levels of reputation. Uh, I mean, preferably don't choose like disreputable oracles. It's not a good idea. But what I meant is like, you know, up and coming oracles mixed with like some more been there a while oracles. Uh, yeah, but it, I guess that that's another good example of how having multiple oracle support also helps us kind of bootstrap this Oracle ecosystem um, because it requires less trust of any given Oracle in order to use them. And so this is kind of like, you know, my, my view with, with kind of the DLC answer to the Oracle problem is that uh, you shouldn't put all of your trust in one place. Uh, you want to kind of hide where you're putting your trust. Um, but you also don't want to like just disperse your trust amongst random entities uh, or say staked entities where like the rich get to decide what the what the truth is or something like that. Instead, you want to choose like some small finite number of trustworthy oracles and you want to secretly disperse your trust amongst them uh, where you can hold them accountable as well um, because they're very public. You're very private. Um, so there's that nice asymmetry as well. Um, yeah, and, and that's kind of the, the full, at, at a high level, I mean, I haven't said how we accomplish multiple Oracle support, but um, this is what we do, and uh, or what we're able to do now, so to speak. Uh, just finished code implementation of this in Bitcoin S. Uh, we're we're going to have a, a test run on mainnet soon, I assume. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the specification is out there now as well for how this is done. So that begs the question, how is it done? Yeah, so um, there are a couple different cases to consider. Um, the first and kind of the simplest kind of DLC is where you have an enumerated set of outcomes. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about how we've made numeric outcomes practical. But, you know, back to the, the OG DLCs are like, you know, like the election bets, like the binary outcome, for example, where you have one of two possibilities or one of three possibilities. Or, you know, you could talk about like at a high level, like what's the, what does, you know, weather.com say the weather is, is it cloudy, sunny, partially cloudy, you know, whatever the enumerated list of, um, you know, qualitative weathers <laughs> there is there you can have an oracle sign that or uh you know all, all sorts of things of this nature where it's not uh some number you're signing it's like one of some set of outcomes you're signing uh so we call that an enumerated outcome dlc and in this case what we do so say let's make it super simple um say we're you know going back a couple months talking about uh an election bet 
uh, which a lot of people were doing using DLCs, um, where either, you know, one party gets all the money if, uh, you know, the Oracle signs Republican win and the other gets if all, if the Oracle signs uh, Democrat win, then uh, what we can do to enable multi-Oracle support is actually quite simple. Say you want to use uh, two of three Oracles, say there's Alice, <coughs> Bob, and Carol, and um, what you do is you, any two of them can be used to execute. So you create a CET for where Alice and Bob sign a Democrat, for where Alice and Bob sign Republican, for where Alice and Carol sign Democrat, Alice and, or sorry, but Alice and Bob sign Democrat, Alice and Bob sign Republican. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll uh, <laughs> explain in high terms. You get it. There, there are going to be six total CETs. Um, there are three ways to choose two. So right, you can do Alice, Bob, Alice, Carol, Bob, Carol. And then for each of those three, there are two things that they could sign, which is Republican and Democrat. So you end up with six CETs uh, that cover all of your cases. So if any two of them agree, that's the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, that's pretty simple. It depends if I have a bunch of cases and, you know, a bunch of oracles out of even more oracles, then you just, uh, you, you do kind of the, you know, the taproot decomposition of multisig, you know, where, uh, you, you write down T of N as a bunch of T of T's. So in this case, we wrote down two of three as a bunch of two of twos, all the possible two of twos. Um, and then we create CTs for each of those. Uh, so this does this introduces a multiplier. Uh, those who are familiar will know that this is an exponential multiplier, meaning that um, mm -hmm. the it, you know going from two to three to three to five, or sorry, two of three to three of five to five of seven or something like that, uh, or I guess I should say five of nine. Um, that grows like the multiplier that you get there grows very quickly. Um, it grows exponentially, but um, it's you know a super simple solution. Uh, it extends like we use this in kind of the other solutions where uh, the more complicated solutions that maybe wouldn't have had this big explosion, uh, you know, aren't able to extend to numeric outcome multi oracle stuff that we care about that I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, but yeah, so essentially this is like the easiest to implement and it's still practical for like most cases right like even if you want to do something like um five of nine oracles uh let me look up real quick what nine choose five is yeah that's still just like 126 x multiplier <laughs> so if you want to do five of nine with like an enumerated outcome where you have like you know even 10 possible outcomes you still end up with just over a thousand um, CETs. So uh, it's it's practical for enumerated outcomes to just kind of do this big explosive thing. Um, and furthermore, because we have these nice reductions for numeric outcomes, where it's always kind of in the thousands, it, it doesn't explode too much, we can even do this for numeric outcomes. Uh, but where rather than you kind of do it after you've done the compression. So you have this set of CETs that covers all of your cases using all of our fancy, you know, sign each bit individually optimizations with rounding. So you, you end up with a set of CETs. And then uh, for each of these CETs, you build one of those for each possible group of, say, two oracles in this case. So you, you build for each CET in the single oracle case that you computed, you make one for the Alice and Bob sign this thing, Alice and Carol sign this thing, or Bob and Carol sign this thing. So you get like a 3x multiplier if you're doing a 2 of 3, which is still practical. Um, now, if you want to go higher and you have like some really big, complicated financial contract, you know, you, you start to creep into the high numbers of CETs. But, you know, if, if you're... If the value in your DLC, if like, you know, if, if you're only doing like 100,000 Satoshis in a DLC these days, like you don't need, you know, five of nine oracles. Like, I mean, you can do that if you want, but um, it'll incur a big cost that probably isn't worth it in terms of computation time and storage time. Or not storage time, but storage space. Um, so there, there are trade-offs here, of course. You know, the more oracles you want to use, the more CETs you're going to end up with, you know, it's a big multiplier. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, two of three, super practical, 
you know, three X multiplier is not big. Three of five, still very doable. Uh, going larger than that, you're going to want to make sure that you optimize before applying the multiplier. You're going to want to do more rounding. Uh, maybe you're willing to like forego certain cases, like say if you're, y yeah, I, I guess there, there's various things you can do to kind of mitigate uh, the trade-off. But at the end of the day, kind of fundamentally, more oracles that you want, more CETs, a bigger CET explosion that you get. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at Bitcoin today, like two of three and three of five are kind of like the stuff you see in the wild. You don't see too much like, you know, 101 out of 200 out there. I don't know if that even fits into the size that you're allowed to do. But um, yeah, since all of this stuff is happening off chain, right? The way that you combine oracles is you literally just uh, add their encryption uh, keys. Uh, or the, the thing that you use to encrypt your signatures, you just add those things together and encrypt with kind of the aggregate thing so that you need all of the signatures in order to combine those signatures and get the uh, aggregate decryption key, which lets you execute. Um, yeah, so that's how we do uh, this for enumerated outcomes. And as I mentioned, if you are doing numeric outcomes, you can do it this way as well. The downside, though, of doing it this way with um, numeric outcomes is say that you have like a BTC price oracle and one of them says that the price is $31,000 and the other one says that it's $31,100 or something like that. Uh, then you don't have that case covered. And, you know, I think practically speaking, most uh, situations where you're doing a numeric outcome you're going to want to expect and allow some amount of difference between the two oracles, if that makes sense. Um, like, even if it's just like, you know, a couple dollars off, you know, you want to make sure that that doesn't like screw you over. Like, oh, I guess we can't execute this contract refund, something like that. Um, yeah, so we, we have a solution to this problem. Uh, originally, I think, uh, there was kind of this idea out there that maybe you could just like, you know, with some other, you know, you have like some primary oracles where you look at all the digits, but then with some of the others, you know, since we're already doing digit decomp, you like ignore the less significant digits, right? You like ignore the, uh, the last bit or the last couple bits of the number. And that way, you know, if they disagree there, you know, say like one Oracle signs, just pretend it's base 10 for a second. That's easier for people to think about than binary. So say, you know, you're signing each of these base 10 digits individually. Say one Oracle says 10,000. The other one says 10,002. Well, if you were ignoring the last digit, they still agreed on all the others. Uh, now, this doesn't really work as is because, right, what if one says 10,000 and the other says uh, 990 or 9,999, right? They agree on no digits, but they're only one off. Um, mm -hmm. So there's kind of that issue there. Uh, but um, the solution is kind of of this spirit where uh, you can ignore some digits. So really what you do is um, you, you split up into a couple different cases where in some cases you can just like ignore some digits and then in others, like the one I mentioned, where it's near a large multiple of 10, or in our case, a large multiple of 2, uh, in a very specific way, then uh, you need two CETs instead of one to cover this case, where either they're on the same side of that break, the same side of 10K, or they're on opposite sides of 10K, um, where you just have another CET that covers like some range and, and some other range. So in order to do this whole scheme uh, with multi-oracle numeric outcomes with bounded differences allowed uh, you need those bounds so there's some parameters involved uh, you have kind of the I, I call it the min fail bound where anything that's below that difference so say you set it to be like 128 so anything beneath 128 is going to be covered meaning if the oracles differ um, from some primary oracle by less than 128 dollars uh, then you're guaranteed that you will have CETs that cover this case. And then you have this other parameter called max error. So say we set that to be like 512. Um, then if you are greater than 512 in difference, so say like one Oracle signs 31K, 
the or the other oracle signs 32k that's going to be more than 512 difference um in this case uh that won't count as agreement so you'll need some other set of oracles right that are agreeing uh or if you don't have any set of oracles that are agreeing uh probably go and fi find some fraud proofs to publish and then uh once that's done uh you know refund or something like this um yeah so uh essentially we have these two uh error bounds and uh how close together the weird thing with this scheme is that there's this weird middle ground where if it's greater than min fail but less than max error um we don't have a guarantee like it's only probabilistic like maybe it works maybe it doesn't um and uh yeah the this weird complexity from a ux perspective which will be hidden from users in in the future don't worry um it's uh will be handled by by the software but um it, it's kind of just uh th there were ways not to have this but they created like truly giant cet explosions uh whereas this way of doing things uh where you have these two different bounds where like uh if it's anything greater than this i don't want to count that as agreement if it's anything less than this i must count it as agreement and if it's in between it could go either way um this scheme ends up giving us actually really nice properties where uh, the multiplier for every new oracle that you add in uh, is less than 2x. It's like very, very nice and contained, uh, especially for, you know, if you're doing two of three, three of five, it ends up being very practical. Uh, even even for larger things, it, it isn't the main contributor to the number of CETs. Um, yeah, but essentially, uh, you you specify you know a couple of parameters you also there's a flag uh that's either just true or false for uh whether that in between space you can either maximize or minimize the number of cases covered in that in between space so you can make it so that usually uh it succeeds if it's in that range or usually it fails if it's in that range uh as well um just to kind of tidy tidy things up but you know at the end of the day uh you know oracles that are gonna lie are usually or, or i guess i should say uh reg regardless of oracles lying in this multi-oracle scheme how it works is you have one oracle that's considered primary in any choice of oracles so say like you know between alice and bob alice is primary between alice and carol uh alice is primary and between bob and carol bob is primary um and so you choose this primary oracle and um that kind of determines the price that you execute on and all of the other oracles are just used to kind of check that they are within bounds of that primary oracle so uh you know if you have your most trustworthy oracle out there uh the, the one that you like the most uh you're going to execute on their price uh even if some other oracle is like out there and you know trying to push the boundary or something like that trying to get away with as much as possible um for for some group of users uh, which again these parameters are chosen by the clients they aren't known to the oracles and they're different between clients like maybe one client uh it, or you know one user is uh you know willing to allow the you know difference between some price oracles say they're using like coinbase and kraken price oracles and uh, gemini as a two of three like you would expect those to be different because they're different markets or different marketplaces uh, mm -hmm. you know they have different order books uh but because of arbitrage you know they end up pretty near each other but you don't expect them to be on the dot so someone who's using different oracles like this might uh you know allow for a much larger difference uh, whereas someone who's like using, you know, two of three different oracles that are all just parroting what Coinbase says or something like this, where they all are just like, you know, essentially just a DLC oracle for the same price feed, you might make the difference allowed there much smaller because um, the only difference you have to account for is like, you know, the couple milliseconds that it took them to like query the API and find out what the price was so that they could sign it. 
uh, which might be different because of like latency over the internet or something like that as opposed to like it literally being a different market um yeah but anyway real, deep real in quick, the weeds just, here um because yeah, i i just want to make sure i i grasp this limbo space between max and min properly yeah so so pretty much like all, all of this is actually done in binary and so the mm -hmm. difference between the max and the min space is just an order of magnitude correct or yeah. at least and so effectively like everything outside of the max you ignore because too much difference or disagreement and everything yeah. under the min you cover um because that's the the small space that you you've accepted the CT bloat is acceptable here yeah and then that kind of in between limbo land because it is an entire order of magnitude um above the min value um on the other side with the max you it's kind of just user's choice whether you want to generate a massive amount of cets to cover limbo land or just kind of do the minimal possible and just hope for the best so actually uh they both whether you minimize or maximize the coverage of this limbo space uh it's the same number of cets uh, the difference is the size of the CETs, meaning, uh, remember I talked about like the Lego sizes, you can choose any power of two. You mm -hmm. choose much larger powers of two if you want to maximize, and you choose as small as possible if you want to minimize. Um, so it's it's the same number of CETs. In fact, there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between if you set this to true or false, you get CETs that correspond to, to one another. Uh, it's just a matter of like, whether you make them as big as possible or as small as possible within the bounds that you're restricted to. So uh, yeah, the, essentially the, the algorithm that I've come up with is uh, primarily like my focus was to minimize the number of um, CETs and to get as good of like an interface for users as I could get. And uh, this is kind of like the, uh, like as minimal as I could get it. Uh, but whether you choose to use really big blocks or really small blocks doesn't affect the number of CTs. So I left that choice up to the user because I can think of use cases kind of for both, right? Like uh, you would probably want to minimize if you were using a bunch of oracles that were parroting the same data stream. You might want to maximize if you were using, you know, Crack and Gemini Coinbase as an example, um, okay. like different data streams. Uh, but yeah, this this is totally up to the the people in the contract whether they minimize or maximize. It is the same number of CTs. I should say the reason that we have this limbo space is because uh, since we want to minimize the number of CTs, we we have kind of this not all too fine grained solution of like choosing these large Lego blocks. Or, or so you you have um you have right your your primary oracle for which you just compute like CTs in the normal single or way using compression and all the stuff we talked about earlier, rounding. Um, and then from that, for all the other oracles, you sign, you, you are literally just uh, checking within bounds. So for every CET uh, of the primary oracle, you want to construct uh, one or two CETs for, second or, for a secondary oracle that just checks that it's within bounds of that one CET. Um, and so there's, you know, essentially, since the only Legos you're allowed to use are powers of two, you're not going to get it exactly right. Like, either you can use a bigger Lego to cover up this smaller CET, this smaller Lego, in such a way that on the left and the right side, you go at least uh, min fail, at least that lower bound of what you must cover. And in that case, you only need one CET. So one case is like you cover it up with a bigger CET. And this isn't going to be precise, so right, it is going to jut out on the edges to like further than min fail, but than max error. So that's kind of why we need that wiggle room. Um, and then the other case is like if I put a big Lego on it, right? I'm only allowed to put those Legos in certain spots, um, like multiples of that power. Um, and uh, if it like is too close to the edge of where I'm allowed to put that Lego, if it's all the way on like the left. So that sure, I cover on the right side. If 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 the secondary oracle goes way over, um, or over by some amount, uh, at least or less than min fail, like I'm covering that. But if it goes under, then I'm not covering all of those cases. And so I need a second CT. I just plop another Lego over on the other side, 
And now if I want to, I can shrink these Legos to be as small as possible so that I'm still covering everything I need to be. Or I can make them as big as possible uh, so that I'm not covering anything I don't, I'm not supposed to. Uh, and, and this is essentially how the algorithm works is it uh, splits it up into, uh, you know, each of the primary Oracle CTs. And then there's a little multiplier introduced in every case where a single covering CT doesn't do the trick. Uh, but as as kind of I've explained, this is kind of coarse grained, right? You're just kind of, you know, using these giant Lego pieces to cover this one very usually tiny one. Um, and because of that, uh, and because of kind of the restrictions of, you know, we can only use powers of two for the sizes of our Legos, um, you usually end up at least jutting out into that limbo space for what you're covering. Uh, and you can try and jut out as much as possible or as little as possible. But you get the same number of CETs either way. Okay, so it's just about like how into that range um, what you have goes. Okay. Yeah, and you want to, I mean, I guess, you know, if I had to sell it as a UX as it stands right now, which, you know, I'm no UX expert, I uh, th this is not how it will be in the future. In the future, I, I doubt that people will have to worry about this very much. But um, you... Uh, Essentially, it, you want to think of like uh, a probability distribution for whether or not it works uh, in this limbo space between min fail and max error. And the closer you are to min fail, the more likely it is that it's covered. And the further away, the less likely. And now you can either like increase the likelihood everywhere or decrease it. Or I mean, it's not everywhere uniformly. Again, the closer you are, the more likely it is. It just kind of it's like 100% likely that it's covered over under min fail. 0% likely that it's covered outside of max error, and then it kind of slopes down in between there. And you can kind of affect that slope. Math! Yeah, but hopefully not for the users. This is, <laughs> like, we're, we're super in the weeds here, but right, all this is for the users is they choose some two of three, three of five oracles, and they, they say like how much error is allowed or something like that. And then like the software does the rest for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and it'll execute for you. And the UX is that you're just, I mean, the UX is very similar in most cases to just a single Oracle because you're still just executing on a single Oracle's price. So you can imagine like if I build like, uh, you know, it, uh, an application kind of like, you know, atomic finances application for election uh, betting or, or something like that, where, you know, I'm one of the Oracles, uh, but also now I can let people use other Oracles but in the case that all of the other oracles agree with me, you still just execute on my price, right? Like everyone has kind of this nice uniform UX, uh, unless like I lie <laughs> or something like this. Um, yeah, so it uh, it still kind of has a very similar UX to single oracle. Uh, another cool feature here is that uh, oracles are super oblivious and none of this kind of, <laughs> this entire specification does not affect them whatsoever. Uh, all everything happens client side. Oracles don't know how many you're using, who you're using, what your threshold is, what your error bounds are. They don't know any of this stuff. Uh, they don't change their behavior. They're still just broadcasting the same signatures. Kind of all of this work is done client side in in private, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the result is that you have like practical, really complicated financial contracts using multiple oracles. Um, and this is kind of really big because I mean, like multi Oracle stuff was not really, I mean, I mean, especially the solution we ended up coming up with, uh, that has like support for bounded differences between numeric outcome oracles and things like this. Like none of this stuff was in the white paper. This is kind of the, uh, the, everything we've, we've talked about, uh, to do with how we've, uh, <laughs> you know, supported numeric cases and multiple oracles and rounding and all this stuff. This is all kind of like actual new work that that has been done that uh, improves the the use and practicality of, of discrete log contracts to kind of be very general because I mean in some sense right all you need is the stuff in the original white paper to do anything you just might need like a million CETs <laughs> right like in theory you can do anything you want uh, using just uh, you know without any of this but in practice you know, you need uh, a, a bit more engineering on that on that side of things. Um, so yeah, this is all new work. Uh, all of these are open PRs on the DLC specs repo. I think they'll be merged um, in in the coming 
months at worst, coming weeks at best. Um, and all of this stuff is going to be included in a V0 um, kind of, of the spec where we're nearing stability. I would say we still have a few months to go, but um, we have a very solid kind of roadmap of what's left to do. Uh, before we kind of have uh, nice stable things on the Oracle side of things and a nice feature set, including multiple Oracles, numeric outcomes, uh, a couple other nice things uh, from the client side for what DLCs are allowed to do. And then we have multiple implementations of these specifications in different languages that are interoperable, uh, that kind of pass the same test vectors. Uh, you know, there's Bitcoin S and Scala. You know, you can use that in Java as well. And... Uh, you know, you can also just over RPC use any of these probably. Uh, and then there's Rust DLC, which is in Rust, uh, that's being worked on uh, by Tibo over at CG, uh, Crypto Garage. And then there's uh, NDLC, which is C Sharp, and it's going to be integrated into BTC Pay Server. Woo. So that's super exciting uh, that Nicola Dorier is working on. Uh, and then there's, uh, this is potentially deprecated. I'm not sure what the state of this is, so maybe it won't be used in the future, but there's a, a library called CFD DLC or DLC CFD. Um, also the Crypto Garage guys, this one's in C++, uh, but I think long-term we want to be using the Rust one over there. Uh, and then there's also, there's a JavaScript wrapper that they're working on that uh, currently communicates with that C++ implementation. Uh, in the future, we'll also communicate with other implementations like Rust and potentially Bitcoin S as well. Um, yeah, some of that stuff is up in the air, but I mean, the the TLDR is like we have a bunch of different implementations of this one specification, kind of like how Lightning, you know, there's like three or four different implementations, uh, depending on how you count, um, three or four or five. Um, and, you know, they all work together. They all, you know, uh, a C Lightning node can pay a uh, an LND node can pay an Eclair node, uh, etc. Uh, because they have the nice bolts, and so we're we're building kind of the equivalent for DLCs with this nice specification where everyone can deterministically compute all of these things, and then uh, hopefully, you know, this V zero acts as a nice kind of black box that in the future we can specify how these things come up on Lightning. You know, do these on liquid, do these with RGB, you know, kind of just, it's, it's a nice, it's a new, uh, you know, kind of like primitive for Bitcoin contracting where you can now uh, use some threshold of some number of oracles uh, for kind of arbitrary contracts, uh, which is super powerful and kind of, it works well with other technologies, right? You can put it on Lightning. You can do stuff with Lightning with these, right? You can have like a CFD uh, that's only like a partial collateral CFD inside of a Lightning channel to kind of accomplish a trustless version of like a rainbow channel, uh, which I, I think we've talked about before, but this is kind of like the synthetic assets on Lightning, liquid synthetic assets on Lightning. So that like on your Lightning wallet, it acts like you have USD, or whatever currency or really anything you want like uh, i sometimes joke and say like you know you can have like patriot points for you know how well the patriots are doing in the nfl or whatever you know you, any index that you want to follow uh, such as the btc usd price which would give you synthetic usd or whatever currency you want uh, but then when you send things over the lightning network you're really sending sats uh, and then if you're sending it to someone who is also using the scheme, like they receive it as whatever currency they're using. Um, but at the end of the day, like it's all uh, Bitcoin collateral on the Lightning Network, you know, still instantaneous transactions. And then you just kind of in the middle of your channel, you know, you have your channel balances. Like I have this much in this channel. You have this much in that channel. And then um, as the price moves, you kind of have like these small payments, like micro payments over small intervals. Uh, to make sure that one side of the channel stays a fixed USD amount. Uh, this required some amount of trust, at least in one party uh, previously. But now what you can do is you can put uh, collateral in the middle of the channel in a DLC. So you lock up funds, 
And then you can think of when the price moves, what you do is you update that DLC. And so one party takes a little bit from that middle bucket and the other party adds a little bit from that middle bucket. So it looks like, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, really what they're doing is they're just paying the other person. But if they refuse to pay, then their collateral can be taken using an oracle that said that the price moved. So it doesn't actually require trust to do this anymore. Uh, so that's like one super cool use case of like, once we have DLCs as a nice black box, integrate it with lightning and get these nice like synthetic asset channels um, where you can do all sorts of cool things with that, uh, including just having a nice UX. Um, oh yeah, and, I mean, that, uh, that's yeah. pretty much a relatively trustless version of strike if you engineer that right yeah it's uh it has it has similarities i i'm to be honest i don't i, I wish i knew more about exactly how strike works i i haven't had time to keep up with it because i've been heads down on dlc stuff but um, yeah i mean at the end of the day it's bitcoin settlement and it's hooked into the lightning network so you can send it off as bitcoin it's that yeah simple. yeah the the trade-off i think uh between between like these two kinds of things is that uh you know if if something if if your channel party you know stops cooperating then uh you know you do get the money that you deserved but like the, the collateral you end up with is btc and you gotta like go automated like automatically as fast as possible put that somewhere and you know there's some on-chain fees potentially associated with that um, whereas if you're using something like strike, uh, I assume that there's some trust involved to where that trust is like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could take strike to court if they cheated you probably. I mean, they're regulated, um, which, which is, uh, you know, good in that sense. Uh, but I, I guess, yeah, the, the downside is there's a little bit of trust, probably some KYC. Uh, but then the upside is like, you actually are like the thing you end up with is the asset as opposed to like bitcoin denominated in that asset so there's there's i i think there's some subtle differences there that uh yeah maybe maybe some use cases make more sense for one and some make more sense for the other but i think at the end of the day like there will be uses for synthetic assets on the lightning network for sure um and uh, it, it'll be super exciting to to see happen i think it's it's kind of one of those things where uh yeah, I mean, I, we were thinking about things like the Rainbow Network uh, at Shredbits even before, like the Rainbow Network white paper popped out, and uh, you know, once once we were <laughs> had DLCs on our radar and we're working on those, like that's been one of the applications we've been super excited to, you know, see happen in the future, among others um, that that DLCs enable. But this is kind of just like a a really nice example of like DLCs are protocol agnostic you know you can use it on bitcoin lightning liquid you can even use it on ethereum like it's it, it is it is in my opinion the better oracle solution to a lot of what's being done in some projects at least uh if i mean i don't know enough about other projects uh to to speak definitively on anything but you know anyone who's using a single oracle tied to like a mechanism should use something like this instead uh anyone who's using really any set of oracles tied to a mechanism like uh, should use this instead if they can. Um, and, you know, these oracles, like, it's not like you need a new oracle for every protocol. You don't need a new oracle for Lightning, a new oracle for Liquid, a new oracle for Bitcoin, a new oracle for ETH. Like, it's just one oracle, they broadcast a signature, and you can use it in all of these places. Um, because, uh, yeah, the, the DLC protocol itself is just so... Um, protocol agnostic like it really just requires multi-sig <laughs> like that's all you need uh in order to i mean digital sig digital signatures and uh specifically multi-sig in order to execute dlcs and then off chain you you do the rest of the work you know you do the adapter signatures uh also known as verifiably encrypted signatures uh you, you kind of do everything off chain using this off chain oracle signature uh, and then the only thing that needs to end up on your ledger or on your channel or on Liquid or wherever is, you know, a funding transaction and a closing transaction. Or in the case of Lightning, you know, you put the funding transaction on your channel somewhere and then you remove it and to move funds around because you're being cooperative usually on a Lightning channel. So, yeah, in, in the future, Lightning will also be useful to not just, um, I mean, you know, I, I think... Uh, it's true that like one of lightning's killer apps is going to be like you know instantaneous international settlement you know that that's final uh that's really cool but then it also lets you do kind of all of these other things that bitcoin can do off chain uh 
once once we have lightning nice and general you'll be able to do like dlcs off chain you'll be able to do uh various other things off chain um so that's another really really cool thing um that they let you do they kind of let you have feeless dlcs so to speak yeah i mean you know and even more private there are so many cool things you can do consumer facing with dlcs but honestly i think it is wildly underappreciated what these could wind up doing in 10 years to actual financial markets i mean Mm. you know like if deliverable futures contracts for differences synthetic assets or like yeah. um, derivatives and all of this and without like kind of central hub points of failure right like you you don't need I mean, I mean you need to find some way of doing matchmaking but you know there are people who are working on decentralized versions of that uh, but you know at the end of the day like a DLC is just between two parties there's no one in between them there's no um, you know thing that they need to go through um they just directly with each other execute dlc um using just like at most two bitcoin transactions uh which could be off chain in the future um Mm -hmm. yeah and and so it lets you like do all of these things like anything you want (laughs) right this is part of why we uh you know optimized so much for numeric cases is because we think that this will be like a huge thing in the future is that you know, people will want to execute on various numeric indices. Um, and and so we wanted to make sure that that was as practical as we could make it. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, you can, you, you can do all of your usual, you know, combinations of shorts and longs that you do in, in today's markets uh, on DLCs without requiring, like, you know, central, like, it's a, it's a very decentralized picture of the future, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, like if you're just doing everything atomically with tokenized or synthetic assets or what have you, like what, what does it even mean when you say this thing is a distinct market? If this is just different places to match orders and different oracles to use, I mean, like if, if I, I just like, I'm at one matchmaking service with some set of oracles and me and the guy I'm in the contract with go, we, we don't like this. Like this, this order book is acting wonky. Like these oracles sketch me out. Let's just move over here. It's done. Nobody can stop you. Like (laughs) what, what, what does that mean for global markets when things like that are possible? Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds exciting. I might not be the best person to ask because I I have no clue. But um, it's certainly like a a new kind of native way of of thinking about um, kind of these, you know, speculative and and, uh, hedging and all these other kinds of use cases for financial contracts where um, you're not reliant on like, you know, the New York Stock Exchange to trade blank or to hedge against blank or, you know, anything like that. And, you know, it also lets us with very low barrier um, to to building, uh, you know, create new kinds of things, right? Like, you know, a lot of people want to be able to hedge against hash rate, you know, uh, create a hash, creating a hash rate oracle. It's probably like a weekend project, if le- if mm-hmm. not less, like it's probably like very, very simple to do. And then, uh, you know, you could create a market around that. You can create a market around all sorts of new kinds of things and all, all sorts of new kinds of, um, you know, useful things that people will will want an Oracle for um, very easily. Like the, the cost or the, the barrier to entry for an Oracle from a cost perspective is very low. Like really um, the, the main thing that, you know, an Oracle needs is to <laughs> be credible and to have people see that they're credible you know kind of in in some in some sense like you know there's some brand aspect to it i suppose but um yeah at the end of the day like you know oracle code is is already open source uh and it'll be out there very soon and uh yeah like anyone can just spin one of these things up for anything that they want to and uh you know a market can form around that and it doesn't require 
uh, you know, any center, so to speak. Really, really beautiful things are being built. Yeah. And also just, you know, I, I like to think of DLCs as like a contracting primitive, right? You have hash locks, point locks, time locks. Now we have Oracle locks. It's just another thing that you can do um, to, to write a contract. And, and really, you know, I think as Bitcoiners, we've discovered you don't need very many, very many things. You know, if you have point locks, time locks and Oracle locks, like you can do most anything like maybe maybe adding escrow locks of some kind lets you do like abstract contract locks in the future but um yeah i mean a very small toolkit ends up being very expressive and basically expressing anything that you need it to um yeah and i mean at the end of the day i i like to think that like any ans an any answer to the oracle problem which you're willing to use uh lets you do anything you want on something as simple as Bitcoin, right? You don't need, um, you know, a, a strong on-chain contracting language. In fact, you don't want it because it doesn't scale that way, right? The The key here is that all of this stuff happens off-chain. DLCs are super scalable. Right? It's just like a single transaction to close. Uh, everything else is off-chain. Uh, so it's, it's both private and it's like the scalable way to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, random yeah. thought. And have you noticed, Nadav, how lately it seems like half of the people in this space are obsessed with attempting to reinvent the model of a federation and somehow make <laughs> it worse? Uh, I, I've not been paying enough attention, but I'll I'll believe you that that. I mean, it would not surprise me if that were the case. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, another interesting, I don't know if I want to call it a white paper. It's its its more of like just a, an email, I guess, to the mailing list that also is on a, a on a web page somewhere. And I've, I've talked to you about this before, I think. Smart Contracts Unchained, mm -hmm. um, kind of a way of using, you know, some threshold of some number of escrows in a, I mean, it's not exactly a federation because like you pick it. It's not... It's not like, you know, oftentimes when people think of a federation, they're thinking of something like Maker, or Liquid, where like you have some T of N entities that are tied to your protocol and you have to use those to use the protocol um, or, or to use that chain or to use whatever. Um, whereas here, you know, what we're talking about is T of N, but where you get to choose the N, right? You, you get to choose what the oracles or escrows are. Um, and, and I think in the future that, uh, you know, that, that's also the right answer to like how, how you do federated stuff, right? You do federated stuff by like privately choosing your own and only using them in cases of dis, um, which is essentially what is spelled out in the smart contracts on chain, uh, proposal, which also I think meshes really well with discrete log contracts. Cause what you can do then, so I should say, um, smart contracts on chain is where, you have some like T of N, say like two of three, three of five uh, escrows, uh, where um, in cases where there aren't disagreement, you and your counterparty just like execute whatever the contract is, where this is literally an arbitrary contract written in whatever language you want, like you know, write it in C++ if you want. I mean, I don't know who would want to do that, but C sharp, say. Um, and, and then what you can do is you can... Um, in cases of cooperation, you know, you don't have to even touch any of the escrows. And in cases where there's the disagreement, then you go to the escrows and they run your program and whatever it spits out, they sign that transaction. Um, and what DLCs let you do in a world where people are doing these kinds of escrow things is they let you replace data with just Oracle signatures. Like it literally lets you kind of have a nice modular world where uh, the the truths that oracles speak to that are public things uh, are their own modules, and then uh, you take all of that burden off of escrows, right? Like escrows literally are just executing contract logic of any kind that you want, uh, and then they are validating signatures, and they don't even know what those signatures are of, right? Like they don't really understand your contracts in order to execute them, and uh, ideally they they can't even. Uh, distinguish between contracts in the future but um yeah this is kind of like 
I, I don't believe that there's anyone currently working on this. I have you know, long-term interest in, in this kind of thing. But yeah, in the future, I think that just Federation stuff in general is going to see that it gets replaced by um, kind of like user-chosen federations that kind of are on the fly, like you get to pick your T of N and they don't know about you unless there's some kind of disagreement that they need to settle. You've got me wondering now what kind of stuff can be structured in a way to extend an oracle and pretty much send them information privately to have them operate on and sign publicly to just settle things non-interactively, um, at least from their end. Um, I'm not sure I like understand what you mean by non-interactively if they have to be sent information. Well, I mean, because they send the information and then sign something and just broadcast publicly. But like what could be structured in a way where that is a, a sufficient thing to do so that um, that yeah. settles properly? So I, I think that it actually is that way, kind of just as is. So with, with DLC oracles, what you can do, if, if you were, do, say, you know, are you talking about like if you have a smart contract on chain kind of scheme where you just like write up an arbitrary contract in whatever language you want, where it executes using oracle signatures. And then so all you would need is code that like processes the oracle signature and, you know, matches, so to speak, on what corresponding case that that leads to yeah um exactly. yeah I, I i think that that's you know that's the nice thing about like dlc oracles right it's just like they're, all they're doing is publicly broadcasting signatures of what the truth is and then you can use that in place of asking like an escrow to have that responsibility you just take all of those responsibilities away and the only thing that an escrow would need to do in this situation is like run some like code in a vm probably uh and and then that code outputs a transaction and they sign it and and that's about all there is to it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but again that that stuff is not built <laughs> or specified uh very much for the future um yeah well there's a lot for the future in this space <laughs> Totally. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, right now speaking more realistically, uh, or not realistically, but more like at the present, uh, I mentioned, you know, we're hoping to get a V zero out there in, in the coming months. Uh, we have kind of a very finite list of things left to do. Um, once we have that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep iterating and making things nicer, but you know, people can just use that version. It'll be nice and, uh, at least somewhat stable. I mean, you know, if you, if you look at like the lightning network, like, all the bolts are still technically in works in progress, but people use the lightning network. So we want to get to kind of that kind of state. And uh, more importantly, we want to get to a state where from the Oracle side of things, things are like steady so that they can publish like here is an event that's happening in two years or something like that. Right. Without having to worry about like things changing. Uh, at least, I mean, we have, we have ways of dealing with things changing for oracles. It's just, easier if we don't have to deal with that so we want to make things as stable as possible for the oracle uh and then you know we can still iterate on the client side uh, without changing anything on the oracle side uh, but we we do want like you know a working thing with the full feature set so that people can can start doing stuff with it and there are already people kind of doing building things with dlcs uh that probably will only be like you know fully released to the public uh, and and put out there once once we kind of solidify this v0 but uh, yeah once we have that there's a bunch of next steps you know i'm sure there will be a v1 where we also add like transfers which we know how to do uh, but aren't part of v0 uh, more interesting combinations of multiple oracles into a single contract we have some of that but not very much and uh, not very complicated things i could imagine that being uh, on on the long term roadmap for DLCs, and then I think you know the most exciting thing that we definitely want to start working towards is getting DLCs and Lightning channels. Um, that's just kind of a, a a big thing that we want to happen. Sadly, or I, I guess not sadly, but just uh, unfortunate for me personally, uh, a lot of that work has to happen on the Lightning implementation side of things. It's not necessarily. Uh, stuff I can just pick up and do uh, without, you know, 
learning another code base, <laughs> so to speak. Um, yeah. But you know, it will end up happening. Like we will get nice generalized Lightning channels that can store all sorts of things and not just HTLCs. Uh, it's it's just a a non trivial amount of work because you know kind of all the Lightning implementations that we have today. Uh, you know, assume HTLCs are are what they have on their channels, and that's kind of baked into like the state machine. For example, the state machine is an HTLC state machine, and so we need to rewrite all of that <laughs> pretty much. Um, it's a it's a big change, but um, it's not just for DLCs. Like it's for lots of things, uh, PTLCs, DLCs, uh, and and just generally speaking, like we want to be able to put anything that you could put on chain off chain which is totally possible. It's just uh, no small task to build. But there are people working on it. Yeah, I think Lightning is going to take a bit to build out and extend for generalization. I mean... Yeah, and like... I mean, we have to remember, it's so young. <laughs> like uh, Lightning's been around for about as long as I have, maybe a bit longer. Um, yeah, do, do you know off the top of your head when Lightning was first like put on mainnet? I want to say March 2018, but I feel yeah. like I'm thinking LND, and I know C Lightning went reckless first. <laughs> well, yeah, anyway, sometime early 2018 ish is uh, is when this stuff started, and it's like so much further along than it was back then, right? We've got all sorts of cool things, MPPs, amps, um, you know nicer things all around figuring stuff out on the onions uh tlvs all sorts of stuff um and more to come of course uh, dual funded channels coming soon i assume uh there's at least uh, a proposal out there that's pretty far along um yeah lots, lots of cool stuff coming to lightning hopefully dlcs is one of them in the coming years just need those oracles I, I I think yeah. post uh, V zero, um, the community is going to have to get together and start memeing at exchanges. You have price feeds. Why the hell don't they work like oracles? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, I, I I am definitely of the uh, of the opinion that uh, we will definitely be seeing exchanges as starting to become DLC oracles. Um, that that is a hundred percent gonna happen gotta meme it to make it so yeah yeah and uh yeah i'm not sure i can name names but there are certainly already exchanges interested in doing this uh that i know of very nice very yeah. nice it'll happen yeah i mean there are a lot of exchanges already kind of being oracles for things on like eth for example and so you know once once dlcs take off it's it's inevitable that we also have it straight from the source uh from them as well which will be nice in before the arguments that that's not legally kosher for some reason, even though it's already happening on ETH. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll, it's certainly more legally kosher than something like what would happen on ETH. Um, so, I mean, maybe not in all cases. Like, maybe some of this stuff is off-chain, but I imagine, you know, a lot of this stuff is on-chain, and, you know, there's no plausible deniability <laughs> whereas you know there's certainly more of that with dlcs but i'm also i'm not the best person to ask about the kind of legal side of things because i have no clue i'm a software engineer nadav don't you know we're all lawyers here we oh. just make this up as we go 21st century man <laughs> yeah that, that sounds about right but yeah no i uh i'm, I'm excited for for all that stuff to come and uh also excited for PTLCs, as as you are very well aware, for for Lightning in in the near future. Oh, as I'm, in I'm really hoping for you know when, when we have those taproot channels, I would be quite upset if they didn't have PTLCs in them. I mean, I'd understand if they wanted to split it off into a second piece of work, but I'd still be sad. We need to break payment correlation because the more academic research comes out about lightning it's like i'm sorry folks we need to bolt on a lot of the things that have been talked about for a while before this has strong guarantees of privacy and not just hoping there's no malicious entities on the network because there probably are yeah i think yeah for lightning i i'm super excited to see 
like spam solutions such as like upfront fees and things like that whatever we end up going with i'm, I'm excited to see that come to fruition uh, i'm excited to see P ptlc's and payment decorrelation and especially as it relates to multipath payments and amps uh, with ptlc's or, or so like today if you use an mpp like as far as i understand it's the same payment hash for all routes right um and you know in the future we'll have nice multipath payments atomic multipath payments um which uh you know are decorrelated and it also lets you kind of like further beef up you know privacy just because people don't know your amounts and it's not as easy to figure out um for for spends because you know they're going along it, it's you split up each payment into multiple payments uh which is practical in all sorts of ways um and yeah i mean payment decorrelation is certainly uh important but personally i'm more interested in ptlc's just selfishly because of all the other things you can do with them like all the like proof of payment for all of these schemes that otherwise wouldn't have it that allows you to kind of build more easily on the application layer on top of all of these lightning protocols like amps um and uh by, by which i mean for those who don't know uh when you pay over lightning you get this receipt atomic with your payment which is the payment pre-image um but it's not really a receipt these days because like everyone along the route gets it and if you're doing an mpp everyone along every route gets it whereas if you're using ptlc's instead of htlc's only one person gets it and it's the payer uh, which is really nice, and it lets you use that payment pre-image like as a receipt on the uh, application layer. So you can use that as like a ticket or you know whatever else. Where's uh, my goods, merchant? Yeah, yeah, and and then on top of that, there's also other cool things like uh, routed DLCs that you can execute on top of a PTLC layer uh, without needing to. Uh, necessarily i mean it's like just an entirely different way of doing dlcs uh but that requires both solutions to spam and solutions to uh or using ptlcs instead of htlcs before we can do that so that that'll happen hopefully someday because i mean those are both things on normal lightning developers radar i believe ptlcs and uh upfront payments or some other solution to spam and once we have those two things uh we can do routed dlcs over lightning which is super exciting Honestly, I'm more partial to just looking at things like used circuit breaker um, setup before looking at things like upfront fees. Like, mm. I think that could really yeah, just I'm, start breaking things. Yeah, I'm I'm not up to date <laughs> on all of the spam mitigation stuff, but I do think you know at some point we'll need some way of pricing in HODL HTLCs, right? Where like the the routing nodes are paid for holding on to these these things uh especially if we want to do something like the things i've proposed we do with ptlc's with like routed dlc's because if you have routed dlc's like essentially you, you know you have to lock up funds along the route uh in or along possibly many routes uh that the total sum that you're locking up is like some multiplier of the size of your contract which is not necessarily going to be a very small amount and then you just hold it for quite a while so i think that that fee needs to to be priced in somehow and i think it it's the same as the spam problem that could work for just just for those use cases and rating that based on the uh the timeout yeah i mean i'd be uh, yeah I, as long as there is a way to do total htlc's which i think that there are actually some real use cases for those um and you know of course maybe maybe there's some routing nodes that are like I'm not into that. Use use a different route, and they have some way of signaling that. Like I think it's fine, uh, whatever way we go with, so long as there there is a way to do it, and it you know compensates people properly and protects against spam. Like we we uh, you know long term lightning. The I, I think it's pretty well known that like lightning is not spam resistant today, and that's just because it's early. Um, and you know once that solution comes in, we can do all sorts of cool things. Mm hmm. Honestly, though, I think, like, really the most important thing, I think, is channels need to move to Schnorr and Taproot, and Lightning devs need to start looking at, um, I think it was Jonas Nick's um, rough idea with ring signatures on all the Taproot outputs, because we 
we need to stop doxing actual channel outputs in the routing graph. Like if you haven't seen, um, there's a new um, privacy analysis that came out like five days ago. Yeah, I think I saw it. They were able to, um, with a high degree of certainty, dox the outputs of a lot of private channels um, just because they're able to use all of the public channel outputs as kind of a starting point for chain analysis. Yeah, and I do think Taproot does solve a lot of that stuff. Um, and, and you know, some some of the other stuff has other solutions. But uh, when I went through that, I I was kind of my my impression was that a lot of this stuff has solutions, and it's just early on. I didn't see too many things where I was like, oh, that's fundamental. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm optimistic. Yeah, it just it 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 needs to happen before normies start flooding onto lightning, thinking everything is magically private and the IRS just starts probing things with their IRS nodes. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of rough edges that could use smoothing out. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it is really impressive that how well it works, even today, um, just on, on the average use case. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you on, on those points. Yeah, and of course, I'd love to see DLCs get on Lightning. That'd be super cool. I, I, want, I want a synthetic wallet synthetic asset wallet where I, I really i have sats and i can spend them as sats but like i can have all sorts of fun you know a, a rainbow channel i don't know I, I, it's just a cool idea yeah i mean it definitely builds off a lot of the things people have been talking about for years as far as what is lightning going to do long term yep yeah yep and then also just you know <laughs> T- taking DLCs off chain is also nice just for normal DLC users because uh you know fees are crazy these days. <laughs> eh get get back to me when we're dealing with $50 fees again. Yeah, I mean I'm, and they'll get crazier, I guess is the the important thing. Point being that uh yeah, I don't know. It's just more activity than back in you know 2018 uh, the the good old days <laughs> yep zero or one one sat per v byte was uh was a was a way you could actually go reliably and not necessarily wait all that long yeah back but... in my day you didn't <laughs> even have to toggle the fee rate up yeah no may, maybe i'm yeah, I'm I'm class of 2018, so I I probably I I can't talk like that, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Do Do you have any other questions, thoughts, DLC, other related? Honestly, uh, my brain is kind of emptied, and uh-huh. I'm shocked that we made it much past the hour mark. <laughs> I, yeah, no, we're we're going on two now. It's just how it goes. Yep. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess I should say if anyone's interested in the spec and the proposals that are out there, all of this stuff is uh, still in PR phase for now, uh, but we'll get merged soon, as I said, uh, for numeric stuff, multi-oracle stuff, all that stuff is out there on the spec. Um, and uh, if you want to contribute, there's there's stuff on there. There's some issues that are lighter weight. Uh, happy to help people on, on that front getting getting involved. We have a, mean, a monthly spec meeting on the first Tuesday of every month. Uh, if, if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, you know, reach out and we can send an invite. Um, it's a, you know, open source space, not uh, one company dominating all DLC work or anything. We've got lots of different people working on all the DLC stuff and we'd love to have more. Uh, if you're interested in building on DLCs, there's, uh, you know, places to discuss that there's a there's a dlc telegram there we have a mailing list now as we mentioned dlc dev is the name of the mailing list um yeah i guess those are all the resources i can think of uh, if you want to learn more about stuff i've also written a lot on the shredbith blog about this stuff uh i'm at nadav underscore cohen that's with a k on twitter yeah nadav at shredbits.com is the email i don't know that's all i got <laughs> 
And I will try to scoop up links to all of those things to toss in the show notes so everybody can just scroll down. And uh, totally. yeah, as always, Nadav, real fun talking to you. And uh, thank you for the brain stretching. Yeah, it's been fun. All right. Hope everyone enjoyed. Adios, punks. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice yet. Yeah, you can have a voice yet. Yeah, you can have a voice yet.